Welcome back to another Q&A video. If you have any questions, post those down below and let's begin. Alex, what angle should the cables have if I'm doing tricep pushdowns? Assuming my body is somewhat vertical with shoulders externally rotated as in your video about them. All depends if you're trying to hit the short or length of position. In general, if your body is 100% vertical as well as the direction of the cable, so you're standing really close to it, the mid with some length in is going to be hit because that is when the form meets a 90 degree angle with that cable. Now, if you back up, you'll find that that cable becomes diagonal. And it's only when the form is almost close to being locked out that you have that same 90 degree angle. And so you're both vertical here, yet the joint angles aren't the same. Now, what happens if you stand all the way back and lean super far forward? Well, now it's as if you're standing close to the cable machine. Likewise, if I do a tricep pushdown facing the opposite direction, such that the cables are coming from behind me, now you're actually hitting the length position quite nicely. Because when your arms are up here, you're already at that 90 degree angle. So it's gonna be here to here, not the bottom portion where there's peak contraction. So now that you know this information, what's the best way to program? Well, the first thing I'll point out is that you should always do tricep pushdowns before your free weight extensions, just because your elbows need to be properly warmed up. And I found that this is the best way of eliminating pain. You're driving in that synovial fluid, getting maximally pumped, more cushion for later on. It's just the way to go. Also, if you want to be efficient, you can combine the mid and short position into one set. Just stand further back, go to failure, then get close, go to failure again. And then you can even turn around, do the overhead extensions or the push downs that I described earlier. This way you demolish every possible joint angle. There's nothing left inside of you. Trust me, if you do this, mark my words, I promise you, you won't be able to bend your elbow even a couple of inches. Your failure is gonna be this. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what happens when you understand the biomechanics behind this. Hey Alex, do you train easy bar skull crushers? If so, what are some standards for that? I used to. I paid my dues with the basics, but these days I don't really do them simply because it doesn't really agree with my hypermobile elbows. And in general, a lot of seasoned lifters will tell you the same thing. After 10 plus years of doing skull crushers, they start to feel a bit off. And the reason couldn't be more simple. Your elbows want to come out, yet you're forcing them in a restricted position. In isolation, because it's not the same as a JM press, where you're getting that lengthening effect on the triceps as you lower the bar. So you have a vertical pattern, but then you're pressing the weight out. And it's somewhat of a partial, so you're really hitting the lateral medial head, right? Different story, but those I will often do with my SSB at the gym with the Smith machine. I think that is probably a much better exercise for most of you. And it's also been responsible for building so many elite benchers in the powerlifting scene. So you know it works from a time-tested perspective and the muscle mass that will be acquired. So out of those two, the jam is actually easier on the elbows when you use the variations I described, but regular skull crushers, they're good exercise, don't get me wrong. I did them for years, and you know what? I might still include them once in a while, but with my current understanding of biomechanics, why not just use cables or dumbbells? Hey, dumbbells are the simplest fix ever. Same exercise, but instead of an easy bar where you have to manually load it, just grab those preset dumbbells or the adjustable ones, whatever. Same exercise, but now each arm is moving independently. You can fully tuck, which by the way, a Swiss bar is probably better than an easy bar if you want to talk about reducing elbow mileage. But with the dumbbells, you can tuck inwards, even supinate at the bottom, and then pronate at the top. You can customize, you can flare out, tuck in, zero restrictions. You can match it according to your structure and that makes all the difference. So this is a universal principle. I apply this to every tricep isolator. If I'm doing a cable push down, I don't want to be locked in here. I need two ropes. I got to come out, bro. That's the secret. Now to answer your question, what's a good strength standard? From what I've seen among many natties on this platform, 100 pounds for three sets of 10 is the standard. No matter what you bench press, 
we all seem to skull crusher a similar amount. Indicating what? That the bench is highly driven by pecs and shoulders. Because, just think about this logically. If a guy like Jeffrey Verity Schofield has almost identical tricep strength to me in terms of free weight extensions, yet his cable extensions put mine to complete shame. Like I'm a novice compared to him. Yet my bench is significantly higher. Doesn't that tell the entire story? So, <laughs> I know it's a little side point, but it is somewhat connected. Basically, if you want big, juicy tries, 100 pounds, try getting that at least. And then you can do whatever you want from there on. Like when I'm doing my uh, dumbbell extensions, 40 pounds each hand, flawless form, zero cheating, no swinging. That's where I'm at. Actually, I'm getting weaker now this cut is progressing. But yeah, that's what I do. 40, 45, I want to go a bit heavier. So it's actually going to be less than your easy bar. But there you have it. Hey, Alex, I've been getting stronger in weighted pull-ups and skill work, yet I still struggle with one-arm pull-up progression training. I've noticed that I struggle with grip and recognize that my biceps are also my weakest link in muscles use. Any advice to help my grip and biceps that are specific to one-arm pull-ups? I got you covered, my man, because I can do six one-arm pull-ups. And I know the pitfalls. I've experienced the plateaus. I get it. The first thing I'm going to tell you is that you probably just need to get stronger at regular weighted chin-ups, then proceed to get lean or even shredded. Yeah, this has an advantage for calisthenics. And if you look at the top street lifters, notice how they're ripped out of their darn minds. Crazy abs, obliques, serratus, chest striations. Like this is a relative strength game, my man. And there's a good chance that if you've been trained this way for a long time, you already have the display. That said, if there is a legitimate weakness, well, there's also a super simple solution for that. And that is doing fat grip chin-ups. See, most bars that I've seen, especially the old school ones, tend to be on the thinner side, similar to a lap pull-down bar, or if it's at least equivalent to an Olympic. Assuming your hands are average size or even below average, you're still gonna get a complete full squeeze on there. And it's very unlikely that your grip is going to fail on pull-ups and you can hold there for time, right? So if that's happening to you when you go weighted, like to me, that just indicates an extreme weakness for one, but it also demonstrates the fact that you never really mess around with thicker implements because that would correct it for 100% of every person watching this video. All of you, yes, I'm making a bold statement. If you consistently train with fat grip pull-ups or thicker implements in general, this is a non-issue. It can't happen. Like you're, you're never going to fail a one rep max or a set of five or 10 because your grip slipped out. Like your forearms couldn't withstand it. Like I get compliments all the time on my forearms. Alex, how are they so freaking juicy? And I, I don't even isolate them anymore, man. You know what I'm saying? They're one of my best body parts. Pull-ups, 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 pull-ups and more pull-ups, but all the variations. You gotta use the thicker implements. You gotta use the rope. You gotta use the ranks. High reps, that'll burn the shit out of your forearms. Low reps going stupid heavy. And then the isometrics are so key in the top position. I said this in the past, but it's true. When you get really strong at pull-ups, the top becomes arguably the most difficult part. And guys usually don't believe me until they also get strong. Get past the three play mark, get close to four, and you'll see what's most difficult. It's not getting from here to here. It's that final bend, getting your chin over the bar. And if you don't experience that, maybe you're doing partials and don't even know it. Film yourself and you'll discover very quickly what you look like. But anyway, I'm just rambling, but grip should not even be a concern if you're using multiple variations. So forget about specificity for now, just get used to freaking hanging, you know? You should be able to hang for three minutes, no problem, if you wanna do a one-arm pull-up. You should be able to hold yourself in this position for a long period of time, even alternating back and forth. Like this should not be difficult whatsoever, including, okay, with the fat grip. Yeah, try that. And that's really gonna build you up. Besides that, watch my recent video on rope pulling. I show you the climbing motion. You wanna talk about specificity towards one-arm pull-ups? 
especially when you're going down, like you're doing a mini one-arm pull-up. Every rep, there's that unilateral action. You know what I'm saying? That'll burn your biceps. It's gonna crush your grip. Your hands are gonna be throbbing in pain. So yeah, bro, start doing the rope stuff, fat grip pull-ups, isometrics at the top, chin-ups with chains can be helpful. And then regarding bicep isolation specificity, it's more so an issue of not having big enough biceps rather than doing curls to match the bar work. But if you do want to be specific, just perform ring curls, problem solve. You're moving your body through space. That's going to be the best way. Otherwise, try out some of the things I said. It's really not complicated. This, this is a weakness that can be overcome very easily when you actually start doing the extra work rather than just trying to drive in more specificity. Like, you can keep trying to do those one-arm chins over and over again, but I'm telling you, this is a better way. And it guarantees it in the long term. Like, you're not going to have any weaknesses. Hey, Alex, what do you think of replacing heavy barbell rows with chest-supported heavy T-bar rows, especially novice program? In a hypertrophy context, you never have to do a barbell row, regular T-bar row, pen lay row, dumbbell row where you're bent forward. Like, anything where you're bent forward is never a necessity. I can be honest about that. But... Ask yourself this, do novices really need to worry about being bent forward when they have 95 pounds in their hands? Really? See, that's what weak biomechanics gurus will have you do. You have no spinal rectors, your back is so flat, there's zero pillars whatsoever, and you're gonna go straight into chest supported rowing because it's more stable and you can push up back to the limit. Well, you could have done the same thing with the classic time proven mass builders because your spinal rectors will not be the limiting factor and you're actually going to adequately grow them which also have high recoverability right now because the stimulus fatigue ratio and everything that you do is legendary let me say it bluntly this is the only time in your lifting journey where bent over rowing of all types are easy to recover from where you don't have to worry about blending you're literally doing a full body workout then you're bending over, hitting some rows, then you're doing good mornings right after. And then 48 hours later, you're squatting again, you're deadlifting again, high frequency. You can do this three to four times a week, yet no injuries, minimal soreness, good form as well, because you haven't hit that point where you're gonna be cheat rowing. Like, you can easily milk this to a 185 to 225 barbell row. And then once you have that base and you actually have some decent thickness from the rear, yeah, you can do chest supported rows till the end of time. You never have to bend over ever again. But do I think it's smart to do it right now when you don't even have a base? Not really. And it's not because it's ineffective. I need to stress that again. It's just, why would you when there's no cons? So that's my take on it. You do what you want, but either way, your back is going to grow at a similar rate. So can those handstand deficit push-ups replace OHP overall? Looking to make a basic home gym after mine expires this January. I have rings and a pull-up bar, which is majority of my upper body exercise and trap bar, but deciding what to do for shoulders. Yes, you already know what you're doing. So I suppose the only question is, do you need to overhead press? Can a handstand push-up be an equivalent replacement? And my answer to that would be yes. As someone who can do a 242 seated OHP and swears by this exercise, all the variations, whether it's seated or standing, using dumbbells, a Swiss bar, common resistance, I love the overhead press to death. It is one of my favorite exercises of all time, and I probably won't ever drop it just because of enjoyment, and it works. No one who gets a strong OHP is gonna have small delts, contrary to what the juice heads are gonna tell you. But me, I will leave my biases aside and tell you the truth. The truth is, yes, you can do exclusively deficit handstand pushups and get freaking massive. Just to say, I have never done three sets of 20. I'm not able. It's that difficult. And if you look at hypertrophy research, you can gain equal mass, but reps all the way up to 30. So it's not like a push-up where you're banging those out, no problem. Even if you try to control the tempo, like deficit handstand push-ups are so brutal. They're on a completely different level that by default, like if you can do high reps, you're already gonna be good at the overhead press and the muscles were adequately stimulated. I suppose the only con would be stability because you're having to bounce yourself through space. But if that's your only vertical press, I would imagine you get really good at it. 
Plus, I'm recommending the wall assisted version, not freestanding. If your question was about the freestanding version, I would say, hell no, that's not a good enough replacement. But if you do it the way that I show you, and remember, I don't care about balance. I don't care about skills. Unlike many other calisthenics athletes, I'm in it for the muscle and the strength. I want to be buff. And I'd be extremely depressed if I was able to do all this shit, but I didn't look like I lifted or I had a mediocre physique. Like, no, I got to be bodybuilder big. Naturally, of course. I got to look like a silver era guy. And that's possible with the correct variations. And the deficit, super range of motion. You're actually getting here. It's not a partial rep where your head is touching the ground or your chin is just barely touching. Like, that's equivalent to what those gym bros do at the gym. Forget about that. No, the deficit where you're going super low. Yeah. What else do you want me to say? When I was bulked up, even getting sets of 10 was difficult. Especially after you've done some other exercises beforehand. So anyone who says you can't grow delts off this movement obviously has no experience. It's more or less a way it's better for building the upper traps, like using seated shrugs instead of power shrugs. See, this is one of those things where experience comes into play. And having done those strict shrugs for years, way back in the day, my traps were literally one of my worst body parts. Completely flat, inexistent. I would get comments all the time between 2013 and early 2015, around there. So there's that little gap where people don't take me seriously because when you film these talking head segments, what do you see? The neck and the traps and the delts, right? So guys thought I was a skinny dude, but it was really my lack of yoke. And this is why I developed the naturally enhanced philosophy. I wanted to figure out what muscles actually make you look big as a natty, not to mention the body fat on top of that with the illusion strategies. So I did all kinds of research, looking into the old school methods and experimenting, of course. And what I came across was cheat rows, power shrugs, and heavy partials, which I did to build my yoke. Not to get better at powerlifting. That was never my intention. And not to induce carryover, which I stated from the very start was not why I was doing the exercise. Yet somehow a bunch of manipulative liars came in and made false statements, which led to a lot of frustrations that could have been completely avoided, not to mention ego lifting. So at the time, I got my absolute best gains ever in the yoke. Like to this day, nothing did as good of a job as doing those heavy rack pulls and block pulls. In general, doing hip hinges, power shrugs, and chi rows. Because really, we're talking about scapula retraction from the chi rows when we're doing those shrugs. And because I was so freaking vertical, it's almost like I was shrugging no matter what exercise I was doing, right? So I was driving in that momentum, getting the squeeze. The power shrug, I was getting the squeeze and then the super stretch, right? Really pulling on the traps. And same thing with the uh, rack pulls. Once I switched to that over the traditional stuff that everyone was recommending at the time, you grab those light dumbbells. I remember reading an article by Brandon Lilly, who I do respect, by the way. He would say, yeah, just grab 55 pound dumbbells, hold it, lower. You know, I did that for a long time. My traps didn't grow at all. That's what I would say regarding direct isolation work. I still find that like if I wanted to hyper accelerate my trap growth, if that was my primary objective, I'd be doing power shrugs. That would be like at the top of my list for sure. That said, some of you may have noticed that my traps actually did get better over the years when I stopped doing that stuff. And the reason is rowing will still build your traps as will most hip hinges, including full range of motion might not be as directed, but I'm a 600 pound deadlifter. You see me trap bar deadlift. 700 for five reps, like I've gotten so much stronger. So I'm still inducing that way to stretch. And then when I use devices like the chest expander, that's getting more or less weight, but not through the shrug. So I would say the stimulus fatigue ratio is more applicable for building the traps to non shrugs, which might sound a bit contradictory, but these are different movements. We're not comparing apples to apples, but yeah, I find that just doing expander work, my wide grip pull-ups, my rows, just having a decent balance program where I'm hitting all the horizontal and vertical is enough to get my traps maintaining and even growing to a certain extent. So I don't find that they're lagging. My neck on the other hand definitely shrunk and that's entirely my fault. I'm lazy with it. Quite honestly, I don't care 
as much as I used to. Like I'm good if it maintains a certain size. But yeah, the traps, you can still grow them without the hyper specialized focus. But like I said, it's possible I would get better gains training that OG fashion, or at least borrowing some elements of it, not the whole thing. Hey Alex, how do you incorporate calisthenics as GPP in your workout schedule? Do you work in muscles to failure or to fatigue in those sessions? Also love your content, best fitness channel out there. Well, thank you, my man. The way that I do it is either immediately after a workout, if my energy is on point, or I'll wait a couple hours, then hit my calisthenics session. And the thing is, it's never to hit muscular failure, though it could happen at times unintentionally. It's really to get my heart rate up, get those muscles burning, very high repetitions, basic variations. I'm not trying to overload or add weight or treat this like hypertrophy training. In a way, my conditioning work is junk volume with an emphasis on me breathing heavily. So if anything, my cardiovascular system will give out first. Like that's what's preventing me from continuing the sets, not me not able to do another push up. So the way I do that is typically with high rep burpee workouts. I find it keeps a good pace going. Like you see me do a thousand push ups, right? I think a thousand burpees is harder because you get out of breath. 50 two pump burpees is way harder than a hundred straight push ups or two sets of 50 with low rest in between because the burpees is also hitting your legs. And it's the fact that you're jumping up and down, like you're moving constantly, right? It's, you gotta breathe, you gotta control yourself. So look, all I'm gonna say, cause I don't have a tremendous amount of footage here, I do this for myself, is to check out Iron Wolf. Those are the kinds of workouts that appeal to me. It's simple stuff, minimal equipment, burpees, push-ups, squats, lunges, jumping jacks, flutter kicks, stuff that the military has been doing for a long time. I like training that kind of way. And I don't really find that it hurts my recovery because it's just high rep endurance kind of training. Should I do good mornings in my back day or my leg day? The good morning is a lower body exercise. It primarily hits the glutes, hamstrings, and spinal rectors, which are through stabilization. Sure, you will get that titanium column action and they get worked thoroughly. No question about it. Same thing for RDLs and conventional delts, but let's keep it real. If you're able to lift hundreds of pounds on a hip hinge, then it's your legs that are doing the majority of the work. And therefore, doing a leg exercise on a back day is in my opinion, counterproductive and will only lead to recovery problems unless you structure your split in such a way where there's enough time in between the leg and the back day but usually that is not the case. So if I'm doing an upper lower, for example, you're screwed right then and there. Well, by the time it's your leg day, your squats are going to be compromised. Spinal rectus, same thing. All your free weight emotions, you're gonna to have to lower the weight tremendously and you're not going to be recovered. So how are you gonna blend it is my question. I don't recommend this. To me, the deadlift is not an opener. It's just an exercise that has a horrible stimulus fatigue ratio that's only going to take away from the work that actually grows your back the best. Horizontal poles, vertical poles. Heck, we could even argue that if you wanna do more free rate of rows, then it's better not deadlift in that session because at least now your spinal rectors are more fresh. Though one can also argue that you primed up your nervous system, right? Well, what about the central fatigue that's generated? If you're trying to grow your back, you do pull-ups, lap pull-downs, etc., and many rows, different angles. That is the best way to do it. Deadlifts help with the spinal rectors, but they're not the primary muscle that get the weight moving from point A to B. And then of course, there's a way to stretch on the traps. Lats can help somewhat, but I've seen plenty of strong natty deadlifters with garbage backs. As in their back is their worst body part, except for the spinal rectors. I will give them that 100% of the time. Anyone who has a strong deadlift will probably have great spinal rectors from bottom to top, but I cannot say the same for the rest. The only exception I would say in regards to good mornings is if you're only training your legs once a week and you want a bit more spinal erector volume in, but you're not gonna be doing free weighted rows. So let's say it's the end of the week, your legs are clearly recovered and you didn't do barbell rows, but this is your final workout. Well, you can throw in some good mornings if you desire. At least this way you're getting 
a bit more frequency for the posterior chain and the spinal rectors don't interfere with anything that you've done because your legs already recovered. So that, that's the only application. And you'd have to pick a variation that is even more biased towards the spinal rectors, like a reverse SSB good morning or a, a high bar good morning. This way the moment arm is longer, there's a higher proximity to failure in that region. Though again, I can argue the same thing for doing a reverse hyperextension or a regular hyperextension. That could be done if your lower body frequency is super low. That's my only exception. Otherwise, separate it. What changes would you make to your novice program now that you've learned more in the years since you've made it? Also, what's your opinion on lunge versus Bulgarian split squats? I don't see you doing many Bulgarian split squats in your videos. In regards to novice program, I'm really not gonna comment much about this because that's its own system. It has over 2 million views, been used by thousands of people. The success stories are always coming out. So that came out in 2015. I'm not gonna change it just because it works. And it's its own little timepiece. It shows where I was programmed at the time for novices and I can't change something that got results. It's like Mark Ripito deleting his starting strength program from the internet. Like there's no way to access it anymore even though it did get results in a lot of people. And then he comes out with this updated version. Like I can't change it knowing that it did work but I can certainly create a new novice program. That 100%, no problem. It would be even better for hypertrophy actually with my new knowledge. But I'm not gonna modify a historical gem that was rather unique at the time and actually got people the results that they wanted. So if you're interested, let me know. And then regarding the lunges and Bulgarian split squats, I actually don't do either that much. And the reason is most bilateral leg exercises will cover the majority of your muscle gains in the legs. And as someone who can squat 507 pounds, I can tell you that barbell back squats, in addition to all the variations that that entails, is what got me the majority of my gains. My legs went up to 27 inches at five foot five this year. Cold, by the way. I didn't do a single Bulgarian split squat. My legs grew like freaking weeds. And you know what? It would have been the same thing if I did hack squats and leg presses. The way that I see it, yes, it is an amazing exercise, but you got to alternate legs, which is annoying. It's less stable. And really the main benefit is the fact that it has a great stimulus to fatigue ratio and you're getting a lengthened rec fem, which will not be adequately developed through squats. But what do I do in addition to squats? I perform sissy squats and leg extensions. Mostly sissy squats though. I actually go weighted on those these days using a pendulum kind of setup. So I attach a daisy chain to uh, my belt squat or anything that's stationary and I get all rec fem in there. So if I want extra volume, which everybody should do in a bodybuilding context, I'd rather do bilateral motion just because it's more stable and it takes less time to do while hitting all the muscles I'm trying to hit. So I'm probably gonna make a video on this, but these days, I don't really do unilateral leg training. And another thing is that when I perform belt squats, I'd argue that's even better than a Bulgarian split squat because now I'm getting a tractioning effect on the lower back while getting more out of less weight. And both my legs are planted and I'm maximally stable. So you have to ask, why are you doing the exercise? As long as I'm hitting barbell back squats and good mornings, any accessory that I do after that point whether it's bilateral or unilateral, is going to be rather equivalent. So it all depends on personal preference. But for me, a very simple workout that covers all my needs, and I do this all the time, is any back squat, good morning, belt squat, cable leg curl, sissy squat or leg extension, and then a lower back isolator, whether it be a back extension or reverse hyperextension. Six exercises. That's probably even overkill in some cases, but that's how I train my legs. That's what got me these gains. Do I need to throw in a Bulgarian split squat in that list? No, I don't. So that's why I don't do them. It's not because of gains. I need to make that extremely clear. 
Anyone who gets stronger than them, anyone who enjoys Bulgarian split squats will experience some of the best gains of their life. Time tested, gains guaranteed. You can do them, absolutely. But I won't because they're annoying as hell. And I find that my variations are just as good and offer potentially slightly more benefits in certain things. Hey Alex, did you lose any muscle mass during a cut? And if so, is it noticeable? Yes, losing muscle mass as a natural is almost inevitable, especially if you're going to get shredded. What I notice is that when I take my body fat to the extreme low levels and I'm dieting for too long, say more than three months, that's when I start to see the muscle shrinking more. But provided that I lose 20 pounds or so, I basically retain all of it. And even so, every time I do cut down, even if I lost a little bit of muscle, I'm still bigger than the last time I was, I was that weight. And what's most significant is the fact that I regain all that muscle mass within two months after eating at maintenance or in a very tiny surplus and about 90% of my strength. So my question is, who the f cares if you lose a bit of gains? It's only temporary. And that's why I'm not afraid of bulking and cutting. Yeah, it sucks on the way down. You're getting smaller in clothes. You see your numbers declining every single workout, a rep loss here and there, sometimes too. Your work capacity, like it is what it is. You're in a calorie deficit. Your body doesn't want that. But the moment you eat just remotely in a way that does not resemble starvation, and everything surges. Heck, just a freaking cheap meal will do it. Last week, I was benching. I think I got 987. And then this week, I got 1010. How? Because I had one cheat meal. Just a freaking reefy did it. Think about that. So you're depleted. Of course, you're going to get weaker. You're going to look smaller. But what happens when you get out of depletion? Heck, what do natural bodybuilders tell you when they come out of a competition? Two weeks later, they look their best. That's when you actually look enhanced. And I can show you a little pose of mine. It was a couple weeks after I got the single digit and you can see my delts look mega enhanced. Like they are round, full, like I look absolutely insane. But it was for a very short duration just because I was getting out of depletion, you know? So. Do I lose muscle? Yeah, of course. And what I notice the most is my bench goes down like crazy. I always lose about 50 pounds in my bench, but then I gain it all back in no time at all and actually go higher than before. And then for back, for some reason, I don't seem to lose muscle mass there. It's actually pretty crazy, but I would say I maintain like 95% of my size. Legs, they definitely shrink. It's typically going to be my glutes. And in the past, it was hamstrings, but now that I'm doing the leg curls, which minimalists would always say, oh yeah, you don't have to because just squat, bro. Well, you're a fucking liar. Squats don't even work your hamstrings. They stabilize at best and hip hinges probably aren't enough either. So on the way down, I've been doing my leg curls and I don't feel like I've lost any muscle in my hammies, which is amazing. Cause last time I got shredded, they were flat like a pancake and it made me very disgusted looking at my legs. Like I was like, what the how can my hamstrings be this small? They look like I never trained them in my entire life. Like inexistent, I lost all my muscle there. It was crazy, right? But that seems to be fine so far. So really, it's just my glutes for the most part. Quads, they're doing good. Uh, adductors probably lost a little bit as well. So I would say a bit of adductors and glutes. That's about it. That's where I lose muscle mass. But like I said, I don't care <laughs> because it comes back like this every single time. So do your boxing cuts, get these freaking gains. Hi Alex, have you ever used deliberate tempo training for your hypertrophy work? It's pretty standard to control the eccentric, but seeing your gains with a high tension chest expander, I was wondering if actively flexing through a slowed dumbbell barbell movement would also be useful. That depends where you're coming from, but what I will say is that if you are hitting muscular failure, then your tempo becomes far less relevant because you got the mechanical tension. So whether it's a one or two second concentric, at the end, there's going to be involuntary slowing of contraction speed. Like you can do the super slow stuff, right? But on the final rep or two, like you can be forcing like a mother 
or even trying to explode, it's not possible. It's still gonna be slow. So what I'm saying is, at the end of a set, you're still gonna get slow. So all you're doing when you deliberately make it slow, getting to that point, is extending the duration of the set and using a lighter weight while minimizing the peak forces. But the time and the tension aspect is not a mechanism for hypertrophy. So it won't really make a big difference whether you're going slightly slower or not. That said, there's two things we can also argue. That when you go explosive, those peak forces can potentially lead to more injuries. Though I haven't seen any data on that. This is purely speculatory. And I would actually argue that if you train explosive exercises, that you adapt to this. So if you do things like dynamic effort, if you do plyometrics and you rotate variations, you train smart, like you're not gonna get injured, you know? So if I do 10 sets of three pull-ups, that doesn't guarantee that I'm gonna tear something in my back just because I was aggressive, you know? We know that the number one risk factor for injuries is overuse. You're not gonna suddenly get injured doing a fast rep. Like if that happens, it's because something else was in the process of leading up to that point. And then the other thing we could argue is that when you move explosively on the concentric, you're stimulating more muscle fibers right off the bat. Like you're getting the type two action while maximizing force output, which is good for hypertrophy. So that's why a lot of experts recommend going fast on the way up, slow on the way down. And when I say slow, I mean no more than about three to four seconds. So tempo is a cool way to change your programming, but it doesn't change the hypertrophy outcomes. All you're doing is affecting the load. All right, final question of the week. What are your thoughts on bent over reverse dumbbell flies, for back traps and shoulders? Recently started doing them and always get insane pump, especially in rear delts. Thanks to your amazing content. Love from Iceland. Much love from Canada, brother. So I still love that exercise. Did it for years, but eventually you hit a point where it's harder to maintain proper form. It can look a little bit sloppy. And that's why John Meadows actually came up with his rear delt swing. And then you get into chest supported variations and maybe manipulating your tempo, squeezing at the top. Like you're trying to do everything to account for the really bad strength curve. I think that's why the reverse pec deck became far more popular. And there's many alternatives to the traditional reverse fly. That said, it does work. And the times that I do perform it, it's always gonna be on an incline bench and I'm gonna bring the dumbbells behind me. I find you get a better rear delt contraction compared to directly out to your sides. So that's my only little pro tip. There's no need to be all the way down bent forward. A lot of guys tend to swing and it doesn't look the cleanest. Uh, otherwise, a step above that would be using a chest expander. This is my go-to way of building the rear delts. And this year they actually improved a lot. Like my posture is actually good now. Naturally, I'm a bit pulled back. I'm far less internally rotated. I worked my upper back, my mobility, and I can even do wider grip stuff. Whereas in the past, it would always cause pain. So when I do those wide grip pull-ups, I notice I'm getting less overuse now. Even without the uh, rotation, I feel like that expander did something to my mobility and my rear delts. I can just handle more stuff. And here, it's 100% straight and you can really feel the squeezing. So this is the in front version. You know, oh my God, I feel my rear delts like crazy. This is my number one at home. And if I'm at the gym, I'm either gonna do it with cables like this or with the reverse pec deck. Those are the best of the best. But like I said, reverse flies were too. Just make sure it's chest supported, use proper form, drop your ego, everything's gonna be fine. Everything works, okay? So with that said guys, we're done this Q&A. I hope you enjoyed it. Let's see some more questions down below and I'll talk to you all in the next one.